The next item of business is a debate on motion 17280 in the name of Tavis Scott on education. Can I invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now? And I call Tavis Scott to speak to and move the motion. Mr Scott, eight minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. We debate education on the 20th anniversary of the Scottish Parliament after 12 years of SNP government and four years on from the First Minister's speech saying education policy is number one. So why do teachers, parents and young people see little evidence that education is this government's main reason for being in office? The perpetual siren of independence has not been switched off. And now, because ironies of ironies, school pupils went on strike, we're in the midst of a climate change crisis. If this government wants to demonstrate what happens in schools, college workshops and university lecture halls really is their main priority, then I suggest that the government starts that approach by leading an annual debate on Scottish education here in this, the nation's parliament, the voice of the Scottish people. Parliament, after all, has listened to 23 education statements since 2016, but no substantial debate on where Scottish education is. The government has indeed opened a debate on mainstreaming and then on the growing of long grass, or as others best know it, educational governance. Instead, uh, once a year, the Education Secretary should set out the government's educational approach, their future plans, and crucially, the funding to make it happen. I do not argue that only money matters in schools, but as all MSPs know, an ability to, live, to deliver for young people and for their future does depend on adequate resources in every classroom and lecture hall across Scotland. Now, the government's sp school spending direction is clear. The introduction of the attainment fund circumvents local government making school spending decisions. In effect, the government is saying we don't trust councils to tackle attainment. Otherwise, why have the attainment fund? So instead, there is now direct funding from central government based on mechanisms which, as we know, do not reflect poverty and deprivation in many parts of Scotland. Far from there being a historic concordat with Scotland's councils, local government now believes that there is a we know best approach in Edinburgh. But to know best is, of course, to have the evidence. The government want to attack the educational attainment gap to close it. That is indeed an admirable objective. What then was the evidence on literacy and numeracy cited by the First Minister in her Wester Hales education speech to justify these new funding routes and indeed the reintroduction of Michael Forsyth's school testing programme? The Scottish Survey of Literacy and Numeracy was cited at some length by the First Minister. What did the government then do? They abolished it. Now, many found that somewhat extraordinary. The government now concede that there will be a five-year data gap before comparable evidence on what is happening in Scottish education will be available. How that sits with saying we want to close a gap we can't measure with data we don't have is somewhat beyond me. Some cynics believe there, that having no comparable educational data until after the Scottish election suits government rather well, but I'm no cynic. No. Hollywood's Education Committee, on a cross-party basis, recommends the reintroduction of an expanded uh, Scottish survey of literacy and numeracy, and perhaps the government will listen to that sensible suggestion. The jury is out on the attainment fund, out when 43,193 primary school pupils across Scotland are today taught in classes of 31 or more. That is 12,000 more children than in 2012. Ask any primary teacher about the reality of ever larger school sizes, class sizes. There used to be an SNP commitment to reduce primary school class sizes, and they were right about that, absolutely right about that. And it is unfortunate this sensible, appro sensible approach has been abandoned. The jury is also out on the attainment fund when there are 1,000 fewer English and maths teachers since 2008 in Scotland schools, out when there are 400 less specialist ASN teachers now compared to four years ago, out when the, for the first time I can ever remember, Shetland cannot recruit a primary school teacher. Every part of Scotland faces similar financial pressures. The government's other main financial initiative is the Pupil Equity Fund, but 40% was underspent in the previous financial year. A thousand teachers are on one-year contracts using the Pupil Equity Fund, and there is no money for school curriculum specialists, for community and youth work staff, and the administrative people who did their level best to reduce the bureaucracy that teachers still face. How is that approach forced on schools and councils by central government, a long-term sustained commitment to education, or indeed a partnership with all who have responsibility for improving standards and giving young people the best chance for their future. 
Presiding officer, I will continue to argue for Curriculum for Excellence. It is the right approach, a long-term change in how Scotland schools operate. But where change is needed is in defining what parents and pupils expect from Curriculum for Excellence. And on that, this government in power for 12 years has not succeeded. Otherwise, why would the General Secretary of Scotland's biggest teaching union tell Parliament that the senior phase in our schools does not have the clarity of purpose? No wonder parents question why policy is to restrict the educational choice their daughters and sons have. Why does East Renfrewshire, as the, uh, as the um, Council explained this morning to Parliament, believe and deliver eight subject choices as in the best interests of their pupils? And yet this is not the case elsewhere. Parents wonder why their young people are being taught to different exams altogether, the increasingly prevalent practice of teaching hires and advanced hires in one classroom. Why are the numbers sitting higher computer science in 2018 lower than the year before, when the economic needs of the country are so manifest in that area? Parents wonder why the numbers of young people taking music, art and a modern language all the way through school is falling. In a world where we are about to be plucked out of the EU, in a world where we need more of our young people to speak a foreign language, where negotiating overseas will affect more parts and industries of Scotland than ever before, is it not right that modern language teaching goes forwards, not backwards? Most parents are none the wiser why their five-year-old boys and girls are being tested in primary one. Why? Because the government have changed their tune on why they reintroduced school testing, having resolutely opposed testing before 2016. No parents were asked about P1 testing. Indeed, no one was asked about the testing regime whatsoever. It just was imposed by central government. Working mums and dads know how important childcare from 8 a.m. through to 6 p.m. is every day. The government are rightly investing in early learning expansion, but, but it simply must go hand in hand with wraparound care. Otherwise, as one mum put it to me last week, she would rather keep the current hours at nursery school and the pre and post work childcare in the private sector than an expansion at school which does not cover her working day. The policy needs to be joined up. Private sector childcare is closing across Scotland. We need it to flourish, not collapse. All of these questions are why the OECD, much cited by government, called for a mid-term review of Curriculum for Excellence, not to rip it up or change Curriculum for Excellence for the sake of change, but to address what is working and what is not, a hard-nosed educational assessment of where Scottish education is. That approach has been endorsed by Parliament, and I hope the government today will set out their plan as to make that sensible approach happen. It would be a welcome acceptance, too, of Parliament's view if the government started implementing the view of this place when a democratic verdict had indeed been reached. The former United States President Woodrow Wilson once observed that for a legislature, vigilant oversight is just as important as legislation. So despite the legislative sword of Damocles that still hangs over local councils, this government, I don't think, is going to take an education bill through this session. So the oversight of government policy, what ministers do and say, and crucially what they spend, is what this place is about. I ask Parliament today, presiding officer, to approve of a government who want to make education their single most important purpose, but that must go hand in hand with the resources, the money in schools, colleges and universities to make that a rea reality. The government's own facts do not support that position, and I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much. I call on John Sweeney to speak to and move amendment 17280.2, Cabinet Secretary, six minutes please. So let me begin by uh, setting out the areas where I agree with Tavish Scott and I agree that uh, education is the central purpose of this government. Uh, it uh, is upon which our policy programme is anchored in this parliamentary term with our determination to close the poverty related attainment gap. I agree with them also on the importance of curriculum for excellence and I welcome constructive discussion about how we enhance and ensure that curriculum for excellence is the right curricular choice. I, recently attended the International Summit of the Teaching Profession in Finland with the General Secretary of the Educational Institute of Scotland and both of us were struck by the admiration that was expressed internationally for the reforms that we had undertaken in Scotland long before I became the Education Secretary to implement Curriculum for Excellence as a curriculum that was relevant and valid for the needs of young people for the 21st century and so it should be. Um, I welcome the suggestion about an annual debate on education and perhaps the, the government may well do that to ensure that we have that to opportunity to reflect on some of these broader trends in performance in education and in some of the challenges that we face. I suppose I put a part company is in some of the, quest, the points raised by Mr Scott in relation to funding for education. We find uh, across early learning, across school education, 
across college and further education provision and university funding, uh, rising expenditure under this government being taken forward. We also see expenditure being, if Mr. Gray, forgive me, um, we also see uh, funding being targeted directly to individual schools through pupil equity funding. And I hear the criticisms that have been levelled by Mr Scott at pupil equity funding. But in my experience, and I saw a fantastic example of it this morning at Hermitage Park Primary School in Edinburgh, pupil equity funding is unleashing a creativity and an innovation within our schools which is enhancing the education of young people within Scotland. Uh, OK, I'll, give, I'll better give away to Mr Gray first. Ian Gray. Um, Mr Swinney must know that University of Scotland tell us that their funding is 11% less than it was just a few years ago. How can what he's just said possibly be true? Because, there is, because there is rising resources going in and total into the university sector. Uh, I'll now give way to Mr Mundell. Oliver I thank Mundell. the Cabinet Secretary for giving way. I hear what he says about pupil equity funding, but does he recognise that there's still a problem for small schools in my constituency, many of whom receive no PEF funding whatsoever? Cabinet Secretary. Well, but PEF funding reaches 95% of schools in Scotland. I appreciate there are challenges about the distribution mechanism, and my officials are engaged with local authorities in trying to find another way of ensuring that we uh, spread that, uh, that funding support even further. Now, I was very surprised that in the motion that Mr Scott brought forward, which refers to issues on staff conditions, recruitment and retention, he made absolutely no reference whatsoever to the pay deal that we've negotiated with Scotland's Teaching Professional Association. Not a single mention of it, which resulted in a 13% increase for all teachers as a minimum over a three-year period. And one of the challenges we faced in recruitment and retention of teachers has been about the fact that we've had to apply, and I had to apply as finance minister, public sector pay constraint. And why did we have to apply public sector pay constraint? We had to apply it because of the austerity created by the Liberal and Conservative government after 2010. So if we're going to have a complete debate about this, let's have a complete debate about this. Now, one of the issues that, um, one of the issues that we have been able to secure is progress in teacher numbers. And we now have the highest number of teachers in our school classrooms since 2010. One of the issues that troubles our teachers is the effective provision of additional support needs provision within our school. And I welcome very much the interest that's been taken in this subject by the, uh, the Education and Skills Committee. And I've today written to the, uh, the convener, I'm writing to the convener of the Education and Skills Committee to set out the government response to the committee's work. One part of that is that the government is prepared to undertake uh, a review of coordinated support plans. Uh, I know this is an issue that uh, Ross Greer has raised within the committee and uh, no doubt will uh, cover in the, the debate today as an issue that he's raised a number of times. But we will consider how to strengthen the guidance and other support available to education authorities on coordinated support plans and will develop this work in partnership with stakeholders to ensure that in every respect we are meeting the needs of every pupil within our country. One of the most important things that we have to focus on is the, what is achieved by our learners. And, what are, and this relates very directly to the Education and Skills Committee inquiry that is currently underway. Our learners are achieving more within Scottish education. They are going on to uh, better destinations than they have ever gone on to before with over 94% of young people leaving school going into a positive destination within three months of leaving school. That is the outcome, the achievement of what, I'm afraid John Lamb will have to forgive me, uh, I'll give way in my closing remarks to um, And those positive destinations are at a record level, recognising the appropriateness and the value of the curricular approach that has been taken to support young people within Scottish education, and I welcome the progress that has been made. At the heart of the government's agenda, the unrelenting focus is to close the poverty-related attainment gap by the pursuit of excellence and equity for all. That is what founds government education policy. That is the consistent direction that we are delivering for education within Scotland. We aim to do that by empowering the teaching profession, by encouraging teachers to operate with a sense of professional agency, supported by professional development, and all of the mechanisms to enable that to happen are now being put in place within Scottish education. I move the amendment that stands in my name, presiding officer, and I look forward to a debate that focuses on what we can achieve to transform the lives of young people in Scotland through the power of education.
Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I call on Ian Gray to speak to move Amendment 17280.15 minutes, Mr Gray. Thank you, President Officer. I rise to support the motion and the amendment uh, in my name. It is worth, I think, going back to the First Minister's start in office and what she said then about education as a priority. Key interventions were a first-person piece in the Daily Record in May 2015 uh, and the speech which Tavish Scott referred to uh, given at Wester Hills Education Centre in August of that year. The Daily Record piece was where the First Minister said, uh, I have a sacred responsibility to make sure that every young person in our land gets the same chance I had. Uh, and she also said, making sure the Scottish education system becomes genuinely one of the best in the world will be a driving and defining priority of my government. In her speech uh, at WEC, she told us that she wanted to close the attainment gap completely. So we are uh, entirely entitled to ask, four years later, how is that going? Uh, in the Daily Record, the First Minister made much of the fact that fewer young people, she said, were leaving school with no qualifications at all. However, four years on, that trend has reversed. And now more young people leave school with nothing at all. Now, the numbers are small, but they matter just as much as those who get five hires matter. And I know that the government will say they move on to positive destinations, but as long as those positive destinations include exploitative zero-hour work, then that is not an acceptable answer. Meanwhile, the evidence shows that in our schools, the curriculum is narrowing with some subjects in danger of disappearing altogether. Now, I don't know if the First Minister studied French or German or art uh, in S4, but if she did, today's pupils are very much in danger of not having those same opportunities that she did. And as for those who go on to hires, yes, more of them are achieving five hires, but teachers and educationalists tell us that most of that progress came before the new national exams were introduced and that choices are narrowing now at higher level too. Pass rates are falling and there is a significant decline, as Mr Scott referred to, in those gaining hires in critical subjects like modern languages and STEM subjects. Now back in 2015, the First Minister promised to invest in teacher numbers announced funding to close the attainment gap, and she said that she was going to track progress with new standardised tests. Yet four years later, and there are still 3,000 fewer teachers than we had 12 years ago. And Mr Scott is right. Any increase we have seen, uh, of around 1,000, has been funded through attainment money, and most of those jobs are temporary contracts. As for the standardised tests, what a shambles that has been. The Education Secretary tells us that they are not meant to provide national data at all, while teachers tell us that they provide no useful information to them. Meanwhile, the government have abolished the measures of attainment we had, so educationalists indeed tell us that we now have no way of measuring attainment in core skills such as literacy and numeracy. So after four years, the government has left us with no way to judge them on that sacred responsibility. It has failed to restore teacher numbers and it is presiding over a narrowing of the curriculum which has seen young people with no qualifications on the rise. Our amendment points to the core problem which has not been addressed. Spending per primary pupil has fallen by £427 a head and in secondary by £265 per pupil since 2010-11. Let's be clear, our teachers are doing a great job. Our pupils do us proud, but they are doing it in the face of less money, fewer teachers, bigger classes and multi-level teaching. They are doing it in the, the context of unwanted and unnecessary reforms, and above all, they are doing it in the face of cuts to core budgets, which additional funding, designed to, cut the, the, uh, to close the attainment gap, has to be used to fill funding gaps instead of narrowing 
that attainment gap. Presiding officer, our schools are certainly not failing, but that is in spite, not because of this government's education policy, which certainly is. Thank you very much. And I call on Liz, 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 Liz Smith to open the Conservatives. Five minutes, please, Ms. Smith. Thank you. I missed uh, that, thankfully. Officer. Um, the, the 2015 OECD report, which examined uh, Scottish schools, said some very interesting things. And it's in that context that I want to address the motion brought to Parliament by Tavis Scott, which the Scottish Conservatives will be supporting. Because th this report made plain just why investment in education is so important. It also said why Scotland has so much potential uh, strength uh, and within its underlying ethos about why there were so many good things in Scottish education, but also why, as yet, we are not able to harness that full potential. And I don't doubt for a minute the very genuine concern across this chamber, including, of course, the Cabinet Secretary, to deliver the highest standards for our young people. But it seems to me abundantly clear that there are several key things getting in the way of the SNP's approach to fulfilling that promise. The OECD report acknowledged that when you introduce educational reform, you can't possibly expect things to turn around overnight, hence why it would have been uh, not sensible to evaluate CFE in the first few years of implementation. But they do go on to say that the midterm evaluation of CFE is crucial and it worried that Scotland uh, was not sufficiently data rich for exactly the reasons that Ian Gray set out when it comes to the measurement of that progress. Something which, of course, made it all the more surprising that the Scottish Government wanted to remove Scotland from some other helpful international data. Because we cannot go on hoping things will turn around when we know that there are some fundamental fault flaws within the accuracy of measurement. So it is surely urgent that there is a comprehensive review of CFE, not its principles, but its structures, because if this does not happen soon, its whole resin debt will be called into question. And as Tavish Scott rightly said, nobody wants that. The OECD makes the point strongly, and I quote, that a priority area for evaluation is to follow closely how CFE is being implemented on the ground. And I think it's very fair to say that the inquiries led by the Education Committee of this Parliament on attainment subject choice have thrown considerable concern uh, from the ground about the impl implementation of CFE. And let me just give two examples. In the debate about P1 testing, there was considerable exp concern expressed about whether the purpose of that testing was clear, whether it was formative or summative. And the Cabinet Secretary himself seemed to muddy the waters on this issue when he gave evidence to the committee on the 20th of February, because it is that lack of clarity and that unwillingness to respect some of the concerns of Parliament uh, that led to further confusion over the P1 tests. And then on subject choice, the real problem that has been flagged up um, is the complete disconnect between the BGE and the senior phase, designed, it seems, in each case by different agencies, and the result that there is now a lack of accountability. And to some extent, I think schools and local authorities have become confused about their role. The Cabinet Secretary said in the last debate on subject choice that there is a tension between CFE allowing schools to have their own autonomy, but also national standards being adhered to. And I think he has a point on that, but they are not and should not be incompatible when it comes to the cu curriculum. Of course. John Sweeney. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful to Liz Smith for giving me, because she does alight on a point that I simply find it difficult to comprehend about the Conservative stance here, because the Conservatives have long argued, and I respect their point of view, for there to be diversity and choice within the decisions that are made at school level. But then she seems to be proffering an argument, which is that there should be more central direction to that than there has been up until now. And I wonder if she could clarify where the Conservatives are on that question. Liz Smith. Uh, yes, absolutely, uh, Cabinet Secretary. There's the qu same question you asked uh, in the last debate, which I answered, is that I, b I fundamentally believe that there has to be a core curriculum which includes what we traditionally see as the core subjects, after which you build around that the flexibility that CFE is designed to have. And that is something that I think many schools have come to agree upon, and that is what the whole debate is about the column structure. There is no reason why we can't, cannot have that core curriculum as well as the flexibility that is required uh, from the, the new subjects and the new skills that have been developed. I don't see why that is incompatible, and I don't think many schools see that uh, either. And I think when it comes to this uh, breadth of the curriculum for which Scotland has obviously uh, been uh, well-renowned, what happened in the past is that youngsters had the English and maths and they had 
a discipline in science, they had a discipline in social science, they had a discipline in modern languages. But at the moment, because of the subject choice issues, we seem to be having a squeeze on some of that choice facility. And that is the concern. And as uh, Tavish Scott, I think, rightly said at the committee this morning, we haven't had an answer as to how that benefits young people, because obviously their experience is completely different in some uh, different local authorities. So, presiding officer, can I just finish on that point? Because I think that is the central problem about curriculum for excellence just now, is there is this disconnect between BGE and all, also the senior phase. Thank you very much. Ms. Smith, and I call Ross Greer before we move to open debate on Lee MacArthur. Ross Greer. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Like colleagues, I'm grateful to Tavish Scott for bringing forward a debate on education in the Parliament this afternoon. I think it's a continuing frustration for many of us that education is rarely something we discuss on government time, leaving opposition parties to use our sparse opportunities to bring up one of the most important issues of public policy in Scotland. It's important not least because education is one of the many areas where the shameful levels of inequality in our society are on display. We all believe that every young person should be given the same opportunity to succeed. But we know that's not the case right now in this country. Pupils from wealthier areas are more likely to succeed both by academic measures and in wider life outcomes than their counterparts from more deprived communities. Most of the underlying reasons for this lie out with our schools. Many of those lie at the feet of the UK government. Child poverty is growing again, largely because of a cruel UK welfare system designed to punish rather than support. But the Scottish Government isn't powerless. It has the capacity to do something genuinely transformative. As the Greens set out in our education paper last year, Level the Playing Field, policies like topping up child benefit by £5 or expanding free bus travel to young people will have a huge impact. They'll have an impact on young people's education outcomes. We know that from experience elsewhere. The Government may have wasted the first half of this Parliament on an education governance bill designed to go nowhere. But now that's indefinitely shelved, there is time to do something much more meaningful. There are about 3,000 fewer teachers today in Scotland than in 2007. The challenges of recruitment and retention are disproportionately felt by schools in our most deprived communities and are driven in large part by issues of pay and workload. I marched with the EIS in Glasgow when they brought close to 30,000 people onto the streets for their fair pay campaign. So the Greens welcome the agreement reached between unions, councils and the Scottish Government. But pay and recruitment aren't the only issues. Time and again, we're told of the huge issues facing young people with additional support needs and those trying to provide that support. The number of pupils with identified additional needs has risen to one in four, while the number of ASN teachers and support staff has fallen by hundreds. And now the staff census is merging additional support needs and classroom assistance into one generalized category making it near impossible to get an accurate picture of the number of specialist staff supporting children with additional needs. Children with these needs do have statutory rights under current legislation, but the existing framework can be difficult to navigate for young people, for their parents and carers, for schools and for local authorities. Our Education Committee has taken evidence on the issue of local councils themselves, not fully understanding what is required of them and what options are available to them. Coordinated support plans are critical to this, and there were much of the confusion lies. They set out clearly what support pupils with particularly profound needs should be receiving. And crucially, as the only statutory plan, they are backed by recourse to the Additional Support Needs Tribunal. We're not short of testimonials from young people and parents who've gone through experiences, nothing short of traumatic, but who, for the lack of a CSP, have had little opportunity for recourse. While the number of pupils identified with an additional need has increased to almost 200,000, the number of CSPs has dropped to just under 2,000 today. That's 1% of young people with identified additional needs having a coordinated support plan. Anecdotally, it seems that councils, when they do understand CSPs, are reluctant to use them given the resource implications. And while this anecdotal evidence is substantial, we need to quite urgently get a picture of what exactly is going on. So following our calls for it in this parliament on a number of occasions, we do welcome the government's commitment to review the use of CSPs. We expect this review to establish why the number has fallen and at the same time, uh, as, at the same time as young people with uh, diagnosed additional needs has grown markedly. And we expect the government to immediately follow that with action to rectify the problem. Addressing CSPs alone will not fix every problem in the education system, but it is the right thing to do and we've asked for it. So the Greens will vote for the amendment today. This is a step forward for the rights of some of our most vulnerable young people. I'm glad today's debate has given us the opportunity to take that step, but I hope the Scottish Government will recognise the need and the demand for them to go much further. 
Thank you very much. And I call Lee MacArthur to be followed by Jenny Gilbruth. Lee MacArthur. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, four years ago, like Liz Smith, I was a member of this Parliament's Education Committee. Since then, uh, what the committee uh, has gained in skills, it appears to have lost in culture, in, in remit uh, at least. But what remains unchanged is the controversy and confusion surrounding the SNP government's uh, national standardised test. Given its origins in the 2016 Act, I can't say that I find that at all surprising. Bounced by the First Minister's announcement that education was to be her number one priority and that the attainment gap would be closed completely, the then Education Secretary, Angela Constant, had to come up with a cunning plan. In response, we had a national improvement framework put on a statutory footing, paving the way for the reintroduction of national standardised tests. News to gladden the heart of Michael Forsyth, perhaps, but certainly not what teachers, parents and other stakeholders have been insisting to the committee was required to address gaps in attainment. To make matters worse, the committee was then given no detail about this framework or indeed the tests involved. It was the classic pig in a poke. And the story kept changing. Faced with compelling evidence that teachers already had a wealth of information on which to ba base assessments and tailor learning for pupils, SNP ministers claimed that this was no good because it wasn't standardised. When it was suggested that national standardisation would inevitably lead to league tables, ministers retorted that data would not be available at school or local authority level, begging the question, what's the point? No one disputes the importance of tackling attainment but as children in Scotland observed at the time, quote, the educational inequalities that stem from socioeconomic disadvantage are complex and multifaceted. They accused ministers of, quote, reducing what is a complex set of issues to an easily identifiable slogan with the hope that this will be amenable <laughs> to equally short-term solutions. Such a damning conclusion echoed earlier criticism from Keir Bloomer, who labelled the government approach pious thinking masquerading as policy making. Roll forward four years and as I say the confusion surrounding and at the heart of the SNP government's approach to national standardised testing only appears to have deepened. Mm. Parliament has of course voted to halt the testing of P1 pupils. Despite that Mr Swinney simply ignores the will of Parliament. Meantime <coughs> 11,500 P1 tests have taken place in schools across Scotland this academic year. As for the justification for the test, the story keeps changing and history keeps on being rewritten. In their desperation to re retrofit a case for national standardised testing, ministers have even gone as far as to shamefully misrepresent the views of international educational experts. It was claimed that uh, Dylan William, Professor of Educational Assessment at UCL and UCLA's Professor um, Popham were supporters of regimes like the SNP's testing proposals. Professor William called this, quote, a perverse misrepresentation of his work, while Professor Popham insisted it was flat-out incorrect. In attempting a clumsy apology, the First Minister then made matters worse by questioning Professor William's understanding of formative <laughs> assessment. After all the ducking and diving, where has this left us? Well, as Ian Gray, I think, rightly observed, certainly no nearer closing gaps in attainment, far less closing them completely. As tests concluded earlier this year, Scotland does not have a standardised testing regime. It just has a badly named national literacy and numeracy test that is costing millions. Whatever they now are, they do not command the confidence of teachers, parents, children or academic experts. And they should be dropped. And I support the motion. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Jenny Gilruth to be followed by Alison Harris. Jenny Gilruth. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I, I was going to start today by saying that perhaps for the first time in his life, uh, Tavish Scott is right. But I have to say that I found his contribution today rather depressing. Nonetheless, Mr Scott's motion states that there is no more important investment than in the education of Scotland's young people. They are the future of this country. And on this point, he is right. Because unless we have an education system which will ensure they all have the same opportunities to succeed in life, irrespective of which party is in government, then we all will have failed them. Today's motion in questions the government's focus, mentioning its policies, staff conditions, recruitment and retention, or the means of measurement of Scottish education. Now, I don't want to be the pupil who blames the question here, but a bit more focus and a full debate might have allowed us to make more progress today. 
As the Cabinet Secretary has previously mentioned, I'm sure that we will all welcome the recently agreed teacher pay settlement. The enhanced pay deal means that an unpromoted teacher will now earn over £41,000 a year. The deal means that we avoided industrial action. The deal means that our children's education did not suffer. But the deal also secured a commitment to tackle workload, support teacher professional development and to enhance leadership. Now, on workload, I recall being in the pub when the original pay deal was rejected with two of my good friends and former teaching colleagues. Both voted to accept the original deal. Both don't vote SNP, what can I say, I attract these people. But both were of the view that it was not just about the money on the table, a growing concern for them around workload related to additional support needs. And for that reason, I very much welcome the government's amendment today to commitment to view the, review rather, the use of coordinated support plans. We know that additional support needs are increasing and that part of that increase is because we now have a system which is better equipped to identify those needs. And whilst, one second, and whilst all teachers should have a baseline understanding of ASN from either their postgraduate qualification or their B.Ed., all young people should be receiving the support they need and their parents or carers shouldn't have to challenge education authorities to ensure that that happens. Yes, I'll take Oliver it. Mundell. Uh, I thank the member for giving way. Can I ask her when uh, additional support needs uh, suddenly uh, bumped up the agenda and why it's taken the government until today to recognise there's a problem? Jenny Gilruth. Um, uh, I thank Oliver Mundell for the intervention. I fundamentally don't accept that point. Um, we've already carried out a, a, an inquiry on the committee, so I'm not necessarily sure why he doesn't think it's on the government's agenda. Um, in terms of looking at teacher retention, though, I've previously highlighted my own frustrations in the chamber about the lack of power I had as a faculty head to appoint because I had to take someone a surplus and even when it came to the permanent appointment, I was not able to interview. That is why teacher empowerment is also so important. We're now moving in Scotland to, from a top-down system from local authority level to a collegiate system, which is focused on teacher agency, which is exactly what the Education and Skills Committee heard in its evidence this morning. And part of that shift will be supported by the regional improvement collaboratives, but part of it also has to come from the profession. Opportunities for CPD will be vital in that respect, and local authorities must also play their part. Now, in 2011, I undertook qualifications through Dundee University to obtain history credits, allowing me to become dual qualified. My employer at the time, Edinburgh City Council, part funded that qualification as an investment in me as an aspiring faculty head. That meant I was retained because my opportunities were not curtailed. On the other hand, we need to look at the practicalities of timetabling CPD opportunities. And I well recall this time eight years ago, having had lead responsibility for organising our annual SD trip to London, being knee deep in SQA marking and having to complete a history assignment all at the same time. Creating opportunities for staff to flourish, particularly in secondary, depends largely upon timetabling opportunities appropriately. And as my fellow secondary teachers will know, this was always meant to be an excellent time of year in the school calendar because May meant study leave. It meant a chance to catch up, to plan for the year ahead, because May meant time. We also need to talk about the progression pathways for teachers and the Education Committee heard evidence just last week about the faculty structure narrowing promotional opportunities for classroom teachers. Because whilst pay is undoubtedly important, if you want to retain talent, you've got to give folks somewhere to go. We have pupil pathways, so what about teacher pathways? Presiding officer, time is short today, so I would conclude with a quote from Professor Andy Hargreaves, who told the Education Committee earlier this year about the importance of stability of government when committing to deliver educational reform. He said, Singapore does not have a democracy as we would understand it, and so has uh, complete stability of government. We can get such stability through cross-party agreement and consensus that education is above political infighting. That is pretty much where the, the, we are in, with Finland. And in that respect, I urge you not to be like Singapore, but perhaps to be a little bit more like Finland. Perhaps today's debate is an opportunity to do just that, to put the pedagogy above politics. We can but hope. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call Alison Harris to be followed by Joanne Lamont. Alison Harris. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Well, here we are again. We're only two weeks into May, and this is the second education debate we've had led by opposition parties in those 14 days. And I want to be very clear to the Scottish Government on one point in particular. This is not political opportunism, as the SNP are fond of saying. This is a genuine and serious concern held by parties across this chamber about the current state of Scottish education. Stakeholders from all walks of life and MSPs today have highlighted the va various ways in which our education system is deteriorating. Here are some examples. Scotland's performance in the international PISA results has continually declined under the SNP. Teacher numbers have fallen by over 3,100 since 2007-8. Public opinion ratings of our schools are at record lows. 
and subject choice has narrowed for children entering S4. Last week, we heard from Larry Flanagan, head of the largest teaching union in Scotland, who talked of an explosion in multi-level teaching since the introduction of the Curriculum for Excellence. This combined class method of teaching is not ideal and has had a negative effect on everyone. One thing that could have begun to turn things around was the SNP's flag flagship education bill, but that was scrapped just before last summer's recess. Well, presiding officer, the government may have scrapped the bill, but they haven't scrapped the problems. Mm -hmm. The Education and Skills Committee has recently been hearing evidence from several stakeholders on the reduction in subject choice. In last week's sessions, Francisco Valdera Gill from the Scottish Council of Deans of Education pointed out that the reduction in subject choice is having knock-on effects on modern languages. He said, and I quote, in 2011 and 2012, there were 28,000 students doing standard grade French. And we have six or 7,000 now. That's, no, I'm sorry, I've only got four minutes. That's approximately a 75% drop. That's incredible. However, when faced with these facts, the SNP revert to denial tactics. We have heard the First Minister, I'm sorry, could you please be quiet, Miss Gilruth, please, I'm not taking interjections from you. However, when faced with these facts, the SNP revert to denial tactics. We have heard the First Minister refusing to answer questions from across the benches on subject choice, instead pointing to statistics about higher attainment. Yep. Well, of course, we welcome improvements in attainment, but trying to say that reduced choice, Fewer teachers, the death of some subjects at school and a fall in international standards is somehow okay because current pupils are getting more hires is completely missing the point. If, as the First Minister likes to say, the evidence from our education system doesn't bear out the analyses that we have brought to the Chamber, then why are teachers, classroom assistants, parents and education experts from far and wide saying there is a problem with our current education system. Now, I'm not an educationalist, nor a professor, a teacher, or indeed an ex-teacher. But when you have Marjorie Kerr, president of the Scottish Association of Geography Teachers, saying S1 to S3 was heavily planned for in the new curriculum, yet S4, 5 and 6 were a rushed afterthought, then I think we have to accept we need change. Scotland's education system is no longer world class. We are letting Scottish children down. We need to come together, face facts and get on with fixing the problems. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call Joanne Lamont to be followed by Gordon MacDonald. Joanne Lamont. Thank you very much. Uh, and I welcome the opportunity to participate in this debate. Anybody who knows me knows that my, uh, at my very core, I want to build consensus. I want people to agree with each other. But you can't, on the one hand, can I say to Jenny Gilruth, you can't, on the one hand, ask for cross-party consensus and building of that agreement and then impugn the motives of those who look at the evidence and express concerns. It's unacceptable simply to say that when people look at the evidence, there's something that needs to be done, you say, well, you're only doing that because. And I also agreed with her that Tavish Scott's speech was depressing because what it identified were the challenges that we face in the education system and the failure so far for the First Minister to live up to her own ambition. But that depression is not an attack on Davis, Tavish Scott. It should be a call to us to recognise the scale and challenge ahead of us. And I would also say to John Swinney, I recognise the constraints that have been placed on his budget by decisions made elsewhere to follow austerity. But no matter the size of your budget, you have a, responsible, a responsibility for the choices you make within that budget. And I simply do not understand why this government has prioritised disproportionately cuts to local government when local government is one of the key drivers to addressing inequality, disadvantage and poverty in our communities. Now, in the short time I have, I want to highlight the issue of multi-level teaching in senior phase, an issue that teachers have flagged up to me directly and we have heard in evidence. As has already been said, Larry Flanagan of the EIS told our committee that there had been, quote, an explosion in multi-level teaching. Now, obviously, that is a concern. And I, what I want to know is 
that that multi-level teaching, which may involve NAT4, NAT5, higher and advanced higher, in the one class, now seems far from being exceptional. A rare response to exceptional circumstances may now be the norm. And does the Cabinet Secretary think that this is acceptable? Does he agree with Education Scotland that this is not an issue? Or does he recognise that there is a serious issue here about ensuring that all our young people are getting the best learning opportunities possible? And that common sense tells us it is much more challenging for staff and students to learn in those multi-level classes? Has he even considered the impact on young people with additional support needs to be in a multi-level class? And I want in particular to emphasise the danger that multi-level teaching far from assisting in closing the attainment gap, may be compounding the inequality that already is advantaged young people are experiencing. Jenny Gilruth. Thank Joanne Lamont for, uh, for giving way. Does Joanne Lamont also recognise that multi-level teaching happened under standard grade previously, where you would have foundation general credit in the same class? It also happened under the previous higher structure, where you might have intermediate two, higher and advanced higher in the same class. This is not something new. But the question I'm asking, is it moving from something that happened from time to time to something that is now the norm and is being timetabled for? An explosion, an explosion, the EIS said. People are telling us in a way that it has happened in much uh, further, more difficulty than in the past. And I just want to ask you to, to recognise that we are potentially making things more difficult for young people who are already disadvantaged. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what quality impact assessment has been done on the acceptance by Education Scotland and the decisions at local level to allow increased use of multi-level teaching? Has he looked at the profile of the subjects where we get more multi-level teaching and indeed the schools themselves where this is happening? Has the Cabinet Secretary looked at whether there is a connection between multi-level teaching and schools in more deprived areas? Because my fear is that what was happening in our most disadvantaged schools, there's a less capacity to deliver on a range of subjects, there's a more likelihood that young people will have to travel away from school to ac access subjects, and that the reality of multi-level teaching will disproportionately be felt in poorer communities. They're very areas that need more support, not less. And in conclusion, can I seek an assurance from the Cabinet Secretary that he does take this matter seriously, and that we, he will at least look are the potential benefits of directing resources to schools which would benefit from a different teacher allocation model which would reduce um, the, the use of multi-level teaching in those disadvantaged areas That's rather than increase it. Thank you very much. I call Gordon MacDonald before we move to the first of our closing speeches. Gordon MacDonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This is the 20th anniversary of the Scottish Parliament and in examining our education system I will highlight what progress has been made over those years. A good starting point would be the Scottish Executive Report, the National Debate on Education, published in 2002, that began the introduction of Curriculum for Excellence. Back then, 49,500 teachers taught 753,000 pupils in 3,000 schools. The teacher-pupil ratio was 15.2. Today, with 64,000 fewer pupils, than 1999-2000, the teacher-pupil ratio has improved to 13.6. Compare that to the rest of the UK, where in England the ratio is 17.9, or in Wales, where it is 19.5. Scotland has the smallest class sizes in the UK. In 1999, most young people left school in S4, and only 22% of S5 pupils gained three or more hires. Today, the majority of young people stay on to fifth and sixth year, resulting in 45% of pupils gaining three or more hires. Back in 2007, when this government came to power, only 61% of school buildings were rated good or satisfactory. Today, that is 87%, with 847 schools having been built or substantially refurbished since 2007-8. In comparison, according to the Royal Institute of British Architects, only 5% of 60,000 buildings and schools surveyed in England were in top condition, performed as intending and operating efficiently. This report also highlighted separate figures which suggested almost a quarter of councils in England rated the condition of school buildings in their areas as extremely poor 
are very poor. So not only are our schools in better condition, we also have more of them per 100,000 pupils than anywhere else in the UK, with 361 schools per 100,000 pupils in Scotland, 324 in Wales and 262 in England. Teachers' pay is substantially higher for classroom teachers than anywhere else in the UK, by much as £5,000 when they reach the top of their scale, resulting in 500 more teachers last year in our schools, continuing the trend of more teachers every year since 2014, and the highest number of primary teachers since 1980. Compared to 20 years ago, we have better teacher-pupil ratios, better schools, more of them, and a larger number of pupils are leaving school with higher qualifications, giving them the opportunity to study at university. Record numbers of Scots are attending university with 37,000 studying for a degree at higher education institutions, including more of them from our deprived communities. Presiding officer, there is one issue that doesn't get enough exposure regarding education or should I say the lack of it in previous years. Back in 2006-07, the number of pupils in Scottish schools who had either temporary exclusions or had been removed from the register under the last Labour Lib Dem ex Scottish executive was 45,000. That's 45,000 young people who missed out in educational opportunities. To put it in context, 64 out of every 1,000 pupils were excluded from education. Today, that number is down to 27 out of every 1,000. Still too many excluded. However, much better in the position south of the border where 382,000 pupils were given a temporary exclusion representing 50 in every 1,000 pupils excluded from school. I'll leave the final point to Councillor Steve McCabe of COSLA, who wrote to the Education Committee this month on our inquiry and subjects choices and stated, it is our view that the way in which local authorities and our schools currently deliver the curriculum represents the most effective way to achieve equity and excellence in Scottish education. Thank you very much. And we now move to closing speeches. I call Ian Gray to be followed by Oliver Mundell. Ian Gray. Thank you very much, President Officer. Um, the poet Alexander Scott, back in uh, 1972, I think, um, wrote a sequence called Scotched of epigrams where he described the Scottish version of various things. My own favourite is Scotch equality, but it includes a swear word, so I'm not going to, uh, to read it. But he had one called Scotch education, which simply read, I tell you, I tell you. And uh, uh, there is no way that that describes the pedagogy in our schools uh, nowadays. It is much more sophisticated and better than that. But I think Mr. Scott is right. It does rather describe the approach of the government to education in recent years. They tell us what they're going to do. They tell us it's working. They tell us everything is fine. They impose their reforms uh, in the face of opposition from pretty well everyone, whether it's tests, the regional collaboratives, the new exams themselves, all brought in and imposed against the wishes of local authorities, against the wishes of teachers, and against the wishes of parents. They often take the same uh, approach to this parliament and have ignored the views of this parliament on issues, for example, like uh, primary one uh, testing. And that has been, I think, Mr. Scott was right, one of the problems we've had uh, over recent years. Um, I, I accept, however, that in the SNP uh, amendment uh, this evening, the government does show a little humility on one issue, that of uh, additional support needs. Uh, we won't be able to support the amendment in the first instance, at least because it does preempt uh, ours. I think the, the Cabinet Secretary will understand. Uh, but I agree it does show some hum humility on additional support needs. But it's very late in the day. The figures on additional support needs are... Uh, uh, remarkable, 81,000 more pupils identified as having additional support needs and as Mr Greer said, around 400 fewer specialist teachers uh, in place. Uh, the First Minister has this afternoon written to the Education Committee in response to our letter about additional support needs and as far as I can see, 
What he is promising is an additional resource is an online resource produced by Education Scotland. That is just not a, a serious response to the concerns that we heard about. And as for coordinated support plans, yes, we need to see more of them, but we have to understand that they provide uh, legal rights which must then be respected and not disregarded in the way, for example, uh, legal rights on uh, waiting times in the NHS have been. As for teachers' pay, I uh, absolutely welcome the teachers' pay deal, but it is a little rich for Mr Swinney to pose as a teacher's friend since the pay deal was dragged out of him by two years of national campaigning, several mass rallies uh, and the threat of strike action. And Roscoe is absolutely right that the pay rise is very welcome, but workload issues remain uh, to be addressed. Now, I talked a little bit about the First Minister's speech at Wester Hills Education Centre. WEC is a school I know quite well. Um, I did a teaching practice there back in the late 70s. Uh, and from 1999, for four years, uh, I represented it when I was the MSP for Edinburgh Pentlands. It is a tremendous school, imaginative, innovative, absolutely at the centre of the community that it serves. It has made enormous progress in terms of attainment and achievement of its pupils. The First Minister was quite right to choose it to make a keynote and showcase speech. But the irony is that only a couple of years after that, the SNP-led Edinburgh Council planned to close WEC down and to rationalise it by merging it with another school. It was only a big campaign by local parents in the community which managed to stop that idea. That was very nearly a telling illustration of the gap between the rhetoric and the reality of an underfunded education system under this government. Thank you very much. And I call Oliver Mundell to be followed by John Swinney. Oliver Mundell. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I, may I begin by thanking Tavish Scott for affording us another opportunity to talk about the government's so-called number one priority. Uh, as other members have said, it's just a shame that once again, uh, the debate is taking place in opposition time. Uh, we are, as my colleague Liz Smith set out at the beginning of the debate, happy to support the Liberal Democrat motion and the Labour amendment at decision time. Uh, we will not, however, be supporting uh, the SNP government's attempt to airbrush uh, challenges we face out of the motion, uh, however consensual their alternative proposed text is. And while, uh, like Ian Gray, uh, I'm pleased the Cabinet Secretary recognises the importance of coordinated support plans and recognises the significant system-wide shortcomings uh, when it comes to the delivery uh, of uh, support for those with additional uh, needs. Uh, I'm perhaps less charitable in my characterisation uh, because I don't understand why this couldn't have been added as an addition uh, to the motion. Uh, and I think it does seem a shame uh, that such an important issue is effectively being used as a fig leaf uh, to spare the Cabinet Secretary's blushes and fend off another defeat for the SNP in this chamber. It seems very difficult to see how a government which can in full uh, recognise the failings within the system uh, and recognise the fact that it has been in charge of education in this country for more than a decade, uh, where the system uh, that is most important for many families and our children is uh, at best stagnating and according to many experts and many of those uh, who care very passionately about education potentially getting worse. I can't see how a government that ignores uh, those voices and ignores the many concerns um, and continues to stick its head in the sand can possibly build consensus or turn things around. Issuing restatements of what they should have been doing anyway doesn't cut it for me and I don't think it cuts it for parents. Of course, um, if you say that, you must be blaming hard-working teachers and uh, speaking in depressing uh, terms and talking uh, our young people down. And of course, the government's failure to listen and act has absolutely no part to play in the matter. They're only there to take credit when things are going well. <laughs> Presiding officer, many members representing constituencies the length and breadth of Scotland have expressed their own concerns in this debate. Some have chosen to talk about Scotland, others, uh, even after 20 years of devolution, have continued to talk about decisions taken uh, elsewhere. And I'm sure uh, people uh, watching and listening to these proceedings at home will see through that. Uh, but I would feel uh, remiss not to highlight the situation in my own local authority, uh, which is jointly run by the SNP, um, and to ask the Cabinet Secretary whether he thinks it's acceptable for the current administration to be cutting teacher numbers in the region 
and enforcing a higher pupil-teacher ratio for composite classes? What does he have to say to parents who now face the prospect that their children could be taught in a small or rural school with up to 25 pupils in the same classroom aged 4 to 12? Why, when he claims to be giving more money uh, to education, does he think that the council are claiming this change is now financially necessary? I'm deeply concerned that these significant cuts will put the safety of individual teachers and pupils at risk. It will make the task of recruiting uh, new teachers to work in smaller schools even more difficult and will in effect lead to the closure of small rural schools over time yep. by stealth. And it seems worse uh, to me because it's in contradiction to the Scottish Government's own policies and guidelines. Yep. This for me is yet another sign that our system is under strain uh, and under such strain now that equity and ex excellence appear to come second best to financial constraints and bureaucracy. Where is the empowerment for these head teachers who not only lose out on pupil equity funding, a point I've been raising now for two years, but who also now see that existing staff are being removed from their school by the central local authority without adequate consultation? I would really be grateful to hear what the Cabinet Secretary has to say to that. Thank you. Thank you. And I call the Cabinet Secretary for Education, John Swinney. Uh, Presiding officer, uh, one of the points in Tavish Scott's motion um, it criticises the focus of the government's education agenda. And uh, I think Ross Greer uh, made the point very strongly that the focus of any education system, and I'm very proud it's the focus of the education system that uh, I have the responsibility to, to lead and to steward, uh, is the tackling of inequality, because the core focus of any education system must be to tackle inequality where it exists in our society and to ensure that every young person is able to fulfil their potential. And it was for these reasons that um, my predecessors, uh, across a number of different political parties, uh, including my own, uh, undertook the reforms that led to the creation of Curriculum for Excellence. And of course, Curriculum for Excellence is, uh, relies upon two uh, critical foundations, the broad general education, and the senior phase of education. Now, I want to take a few moments to just talk about the issue of breadth of the curriculum, because this has been very much the underpinning the inquiry that the Education and Skills Committee has been undertaking, and it's been the commentary of a number of contributors to this debate. I do not believe that the broad general education narrows the educational opportunities of young people. I totally reject that point of view. Because the broad general education is designed to give young people the opportunity to experience eight curricular areas with a breadth and depth of learning which was greater in the broad general education than when I was educated in the 1970s and 1980s. And this debate about narrowing the curriculum ignores that fundamental element of the reform. Yeah, of course. Smith. I can accept a lot of that about BGE. Where there is narrowing is in the senior phase of the core curriculum. That's, that's why the Education Committee is having an inquiry about this issue, and that is what is the main concern of so many people who have given evidence to it. John Sweeney. We, we will, of course, look at all of these issues in further detail, but that brings me on to the senior phase, where there are curricular models that essentially offer young people in the much-criticised six-choice uh, option in S4, curricular options taken forward in individual schools and local authorities, which over a three-year period offer young people 18 options to take forward senior phase qualifications. 18. That's more options than I had when I was at school to take forward. And I took forward the maximum that I had available to me. But it's about looking at the senior phase as a three-year experience, not as a one-year experience in S4. And, uh, of course... I entirely take, I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for giving away. I entirely take the point you just made about the three-year senior phase. But would that not be one of the aspects that could be carefully considered by the OECD review that, we, that Parliament considered last week? And I think, in fairness, the government accepted as part of Ian Gray's motion a fortnight or so ago. Is that not exactly the kind of issue that could be addressed in that mid-term review of CFP? I, I, I think that is entirely one of the issues that could be looked at this question. I mean, what that takes us into is a debate then which has rippled its way through this debate which is the degree to which there should be autonomy and empowerment at local level to decide on curricular choices and the degree to which there should be prescription from the centre. And Parliament knows where I stand on this debate. 
I want maximum curricular choice at the local level and I will defend that and I will assert that and that's a central part of the education reforms that, if Mr Mundell would forgive me, the education reforms that I'm taking, part, taking forward, which, counter to what Ian Gray said, are not opposed by everybody. We are now implementing the education reform agenda about the empowerment of schools that I agreed with the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities. And that implementation agenda is now underway with the publication of the Head Teachers Charter, the review of financial mechanisms, the extension of curricular choice and staffing choices for schools at local level. All of that is an agenda that is proceeding forward. Now, I don't have much more time to sum up on the debate, but let me just say this in conclusion to Parliament. I am very keen to engage in a reasoned debate about the substance and the opportunities of education. I engage with the education system every single day. I hear and see lots of very, very strong examples of innovation, of creativity being undertaken at local level. We're investing in it with the teacher's pay deal that I've talked about in my earlier remarks. We're investing in it by pupil equity funding, which is making a huge difference at local level. We're investing it in the Scottish Attainment Challenge. We're investing in it by increased resources for local authorities. We will continue to do that in pursuit of the government's policy focus on education, which is to deliver excellence and equity for all of our pupils and to make sure young people go on to the best destinations they possibly can do as a result of experiencing the world-class education they can get in Scotland. Anna Colin, Willie Rennie to conclude our debate. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, members will be aware that this is Mental Health Week. Um, and I just want to draw attention to a couple of important statistics around about how this impacts upon our education system and perhaps gives us a little bit of a window into their world. That half of all teachers, as a result of pressure at work, have, as a result, had a mental health problem exacerbated or caused. Secondly, 44% of teachers have had to see a doctor as a result of their mental health problem. Now, to me, that tells us about the significant pressure that those teachers are under. Now, we need those teachers to excel in order to get our education system back up to being the best again. Our futures are in their hands. And I think we owe them much better than this. I think we need to devise a system that is supporting our school teachers rather than causing all this pressure. I'll take an intervention. I'm grateful to Mr Rennie for giving way, and I associate myself entirely with the comments he's made about the importance of supporting and protecting the mental health of teachers, which is why our pay deal involves workload reductions into the bargain. But does Mr Rennie also accept that some of the judgments made at local authority level about the volume of subject choice is to protect the mental health of pupils who faced a, a significant amount of stress by undertaking a larger number of qualifications than they currently undertake. Willie Rennie. Of course we've actually got to trust the schools and the teachers to make sure they're looking after the mental health of their pupils. That is essential and that is why we support the efforts that are going on in schools in order to support pupils with their mental health issues. But I have to say, this government is making it worse. If you look at the range of policies that have been devised by this government in order to try and drive up the quality of education in Scotland, after that First Minister's speech four years ago, it's four years ago members will be familiar that she made that speech about it being a sacred duty of hers and she should be judged on that sacred duty. But the policies that have been devised since then as Ian Gray quite rightly pointed out, in many cases are unnecessary and unwanted. Take the national testing, which I thought Liam MacArthur set out very, very well. He talked about the, the confused purpose. He talked about the fact that many teachers already had a scheme of assessing the performance of their pupils, that these new tests did not add anything to the sum of knowledge that they had. And also, the government's original intention was to be able to compare. And then they said, of course we're not going to compare because that could lead to league tables. Well, what is the purpose of having standardised national tests if you cannot compare? A confused purpose. But since then, since that, government, since that parliament vote in September last year, the government has carried on regardless. 11,500 tests in schools, flouting the will of this institution. 
Look at Curriculum for Excellence. There was support right across the chamber for Curriculum for Excellence, but this government's bungled implementation of it has undermined the Curriculum for Excellence. It was supposed to bring freedom to the teachers, to be able to use the skills and talents that they have gained over the years. Now it has resulted in increasing bureaucracy that has hindered their opportunity to do the best for their teachers. Look at the, the issue of the regional collaboratives, adding an extra layer of bureaucracy in our education system with confused accountability. The Pupil Equity Fund, I was curious about John Swinney's endless praise of the Pupil Equity Fund. He opposed it for five years while we asked him to implement it. In fact, one of his members, Willie Coffey, said it would be dangerous and ridiculous to implement the policy. Now John Swinney praises that policy. But the bungled implementation of that policy has resulted in an underspend of it in 2017-18. And it's so poorly designed, it's also plugging the gaps in the funding that's provided to those schools. And then nursery education, something that's incredibly close to my heart. Very, very important. It's the way to try and improve the life chances of young people. Look at the warnings from Audit Scotland, from Edinburgh Council, who say the policy is now at risk. And meantime, Mary Todd, who's smiling at me right just now, she said all of this news was encouraging. <laughs> We've had an 18% under recruitment on planned recruitment. We've got a massive reduction in childminders. We've got nurseries closing. This is not the good foundations for the rolling out of this policy. This government has undermined the education system in this country. It is about time it recognised that it is undermining that system and did its job properly. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr Reddy. And that concludes our debate on education. A point of order from Oliver Mundell. Thank you, President Officer. I raise a point of order under Rule 8.17 of Standing Orders to seek your clarification as to whether the proper procedures are being followed in relation to the Children Equal Protection from Assault Scotland Bill, with particular reference to Rule 12.8 on reports of committees and in relation to the wider committee guidance. Ahead of tomorrow's meeting, I have become aware that the clerks appear to have retrospectively edited the minutes of the committee's meeting of 25th April, originally posted on the Scottish Parliament website. A new document, not created until some two weeks after the meeting, now appears in its place, minus the critically important text confirming that the Stage 1 report on the Bill had been completed and arrangements for its publication were agreed. Furthermore, Presiding Officer, I received an email from the clerk on the 30th of April to confirm the embargo on the final report was 10th May. No meeting of the committee following the 25th of April and prior to the 10th of May referenced the Bill uh, on its agenda. As such, I'd be grateful if you could clarify under what procedure the committee clerks amended the already published committee minutes of 25th April, what the rationale was for doing so, why all committee members were not formally made aware of this change, if you will ask for the original minutes to be reissued, whether you believe this retrospective amendment of the minutes meets the level of transparency expected of the Parliament, and whether you recognise the challenge this creates when it comes to ensuring due parliamentary process is followed. In relation to the report itself, I would be grateful if you could confirm to the Chamber whether you believe the report in question has been completed. If not, when and under what procedure the decisions of the committee taken on the 25th of April were reversed? If so, why it has not been published as intimated by the clerks? Why, again, all members of the committee were not formally notified of the change to publication plans? And in the event that it is permissible for a committee to reopen a report, or you consider that the report is not completed, can you confirm if it would be open to any member of the committee to request that further oral evidence is taken from additional witnesses and indeed to revisit any text and sections which have already been agreed? And in addition, if you would rule under the procedure outlined under section 5.67 of the guidance on committees, whether you would consider it appropriate for a majority of members to comment further within a committee report on the views expressed by a minority without allowing the minority a further right to reply or alternatively to reconsider their previous decision to agree by consensus not to proceed under section 5.66 of committee guidance. Finally, presiding officer, in the event that you are unable to rule on all of these matters this evening, what advice can you give in relation to the procedural validity of any business uh, or decisions relating to these matters which may be taken at the committee tomorrow morning. Thank you.
Uh, first of all, can I say uh, thank you to Oliver Mundell for giving me advance notice of what was obviously a, a lengthy and detailed point of order. Uh, I have considered this matter. I recognise that Mr Mundell has concerns and is looking for procedural advice as well as any other items he wishes to raise. However, uh, these strike me as matters for the committee itself and uh, for the committee convener and clerks to advise on. In general, matters which might be points of order in the chamber are normally matters for a convener in the context of co committee business. So in this matter, I also note that the committee is meeting tomorrow morning. So my advice would be to pursue this matter with uh, members of the uh, committee and in particular with the convener and clerks of the committee tomorrow morning. And on that note, we will move now to the next item of business, which is consideration of business motion 17286 in the name of Graham Day, on behalf of the Parliament of do setting out a business programme. Could I call on Graham Day to move that motion? So I could I call on Graham Day to move the motion? Uh, move, presenting officer. Thank you very much. And no member wishes to speak on this motion, so the question is that motion 17286 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The next item is consideration of business motion 17287 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau on the stage two timetable for a bill. Could, again, could I call on the Minister to move this motion? Move, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. And again, no one wishes to speak on this motion. The question, therefore, is that motion 17287 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next item is consideration of three Parliamentary Bureau motions. Could I call on Graham Day to move motions 17288 on approval of an SSI, 17289 on designation of a lead committee, and 17297 on a committee meeting at the same time as the Parliament. Move, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. We're going to turn now to decision time, and there are several questions this evening. Uh, the first question, and I would remind members before the first question, which is an amendment in the name of Jean Freeman, that if it is agreed, then the amendment in the name of Monica Lennon will fall. So the first question is that amendment 17281.4 in the name of Jean Freeman, which seeks to amend motion 17281 in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton on treatment time guarantee be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 17281.4 in the name of Jean Freeman is yes, 57, no, 59. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that amendment 17281.1 in the name of Miles Briggs, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton, be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 17281.1 in the name of Miles Briggs is yes, 53, no, 57. There were six abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that amendment 17281.2 in the name of Monica Lennon, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now.
The result of the vote on Amendment Number 17281.2 in the name of Monica Lennon is yes, 53, no, 57. There were six abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. And the next question is that motion 17281 in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton on treatment time guarantee be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast the votes now. The result of the vote on, amend, sorry, on motion 17281 in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton is yes, 53, no, 63. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore not agreed. Before we move to the next question, I would remind members that if the amendment in the name of John Swinney is agreed, then the amendment in the name of Ian Gray will fall. The question is that amendment 17280 17280.2 in the name of John Swinney, which seeks to amend motion 17280 in the name of Tavish Scott on education, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to division. Members may vote now. The result of the vote on amendment number 17280.2 in the name of John Swinney is yes, 63, no, 52. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. That means that the amendment in the name of Ian Gray is preempted. We move to the next question, which is that motion 17280 in the name of Tavish Scott as amended on education be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast. I'll just check. Are we all agreed? No, we are agreed. And I propose to ask a single question on three parliamentary bureau motions. Does anyone object? No. The, question, the question is that motions 17288, 17289 and 17297 in the name of Graham Day and behalf of the bureau be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. We're going to move shortly to members' business in the name of Kezia Dugdale on Foster Care Fortnight 2019. But we'll just take a few moments for members, the minister and others to change seats. <laughs>